All right, y'all, I just wanted to give you a little pep talk before tonight's big ACC Inventor Prize. Now, I know you didn't make it to the final finals, but you made it here, and you are all winners, okay? Now, I, I took an intro to psychology class in college, so I am trained for situations like this. So I just wanted to open it up so we could talk about healing, you know? Like, like you guys, the food bank in Panama, that is amazing, and I know you're going to get funding. Thank you, but we already uh, got some funding. You did? Yeah, $450,000. What? $450,000, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, your invention was incredible and I don't want you to worry, it's gonna go to market. Well, we've already installed a test pilot. Oh, well, there you go. You've already installed a test pilot. Yeah, we've so already housed 84 people. You've housed 84 people, yeah, that's resilience. Global. You're you're global? That's like bigger than local. Cullen, Cullen, don't look so glum. I'm not going to pay. I've got to meet in the patent attorney I've got to get to now. You got, you got a an attorney. Yep. Wow, okay. So we need to get back to the lab to continue development. Uh, okay, you're yeah. going to the lab? Do you want to do a trust fall? We oh, I'm okay. Oh, so okay. We have a call. You have a call. All right. But yeah, we have a pilot study to get. Okay, to pilot study. A meeting study. with investors. A meeting with investors. You've got, you guys. Interview want, with Forbes. You've got an interview with Forbes. Okay. You see, I think it's time for a, just a big group hug. Okay. I think we've done some really good healing here. Live from the campus of the Georgia Institute of Technology, it's the 2016 ACC Inventure Prize. Join us as the finest students from across the Atlantic Coast Conference unveil the future and compete to win $30,000 in prizes and patents. Please welcome your host and the award winner, Faith Saley. to the first ever ACC Inventure Prize. I am so excited to be your host this evening, not only because I have a front row seat to all of tonight's mind-blowing inventions, but also because the Atlantic Coast Conference itself is amazing. And trust me, trust me, you guys, I am not biased because I, I went to an Ivy League school, so I mean, now that I think about it, this is probably the largest group of ACC students I've ever seen who weren't knocking my alma mater out of a tournament. So there you go. Uh, we have an amazing show for you tonight, but our competition officially began last night when 15 teams from across the ACC presented their unique inventions and concepts in our preliminary round. Tonight, the top five teams emerging from that round will battle it out for $30,000 in prizes, including first place, second place, and our People's Choice Award. So, to learn more about those, let's send it over to my fabulous co-host, Ashley Mengwasser. Thanks, Faith. It's great to be here and to see all of the support for our inaugural class of ACC Inventure Prize finalists. Now, I'll be speaking with several of their fans later tonight, but first, let's talk about those prizes you mentioned. The team that wins first place will receive 15,000 bucks to help take their idea to the next level. The team that wins second place will also earn some money to help fund their business in the amount of $10,000. And while the judges determine which teams are awarded those two prizes, it's up to the viewers, that's you, to decide who gets our People's Choice Award. That's right. Right. If you have a favorite team and you want to make sure that they go home with a check for uh, five grand, you'll need to text that team's keyword to 22333 or visit polyv.com slash adventure prize. Now, voting won't open until all five teams have presented. I'll give you each team's keyword at the end of their presentation, and I'll remind you of them again when it is time to vote. So be careful to avoid autocorrect. You'll need to type those keywords exactly as they appear on screen, or your vote won't register. You can only vote once per device, so choose once and choose wisely. And again, I'll let you know when it's time to vote, but for now, I send it back to you, Faith. Thank you, Ashley. Our judges have taken their seats and are ready to begin. Now, none of them has any affiliation with the ACC, so they're here to give their unbiased opinion and crown tonight's top teams. But before we put them to work, let's learn a little bit, little bit more about who they are. 
You could say our first judge got an early start in technology, and that would be an understatement. She began writing code when she was only six years old and has since established herself as an entrepreneur and advertising specialist. Now she helps mentor entrepreneurs and growing businesses as a distribution partner for a company called 500 Startups. Please welcome Ms. Tammy Camp. Also on our panel is the co-founder of FastWorks, a program at General Electric that combines a set of tools and behaviors designed to deliver better outcomes for customers faster, supporting growth initiatives and introducing a new way of working for all employees. Please give a warm welcome to the Director of Innovation Acceleration of GE, Ms. Viv Goldstein. Our third judge was educated at Brown University, the Sorbonne, and Oxford. He's a true Renaissance man with careers in both the sciences and the arts. He's a critically acclaimed author, as well as the vice president of programs and program director at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Please welcome Mr. Doran Weber. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> Now, the order of tonight's presenters was drawn out of a hat, so let's meet our first team, which happens to be from Georgia Tech, Team Firehud. Hi, we're Team Firehud from Georgia Tech. Currently, there are about one million firefighters in the United States. These firefighters incur about 63,500 injuries per year. That's because firefighters lack critical information that would keep them safer in fires. Firefighters are first responders and everyday heroes who deserve the best equipment possible, and we're here to provide that. Firehood, protecting, protecting our protectors. Okay, I'm intrigued. Team Firehood, take it away. Hi, I'm Tyler. And I'm Zach. And we are Team Firehood. We've also brought along CJ, who is a firefighter, to help demonstrate our product. In the US, there are about one million firefighters, just like CJ, who risk their lives every day to help protect people like me or you. These acts of selfless bravery is not something that they simply do, it's who they are. Unfortunately, they do not always come home. The number one killer of firefighters is sudden cardiac arrest, and the number one injury is overexertion. The true problem is the firefighters are so focused on rescuing others that they do not realize that they are pushing their bodies past their limits. We have created a solution that will allow the firefighters to see both bodily and environmental data in real time. CJ is currently wearing FireHUD. FireHUD is the next generation in firefighting equipment. It includes a heads-up display for firefighters and a software application for their commanding officers outside, which will display life-critical information. This information includes things such as internal and external temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate. Up until now, this information has been unavailable. Let me show you the display that CJ is looking at right now. This is what it looks like to put FireHUD on. As your eye gets closer to the display, everything comes into focus. The top three areas of the display are where all of the life critical information is located. The bottom two areas that you see is the communication area with the incident commander. The incident commander is the outside official directing the entire fire operation. This is the screen that they see. For the first time, the incident, the incident commander now has a detailed profile of the firefighters in the fire. We recently took FireHUD to be field tested. All the firefighters at the test were extremely excited and eager to try it out. One firefighter even brought the device into a burning building. We got great feedback and input from all the firefighters at the test. Let's hear what CJ has to say about it. I truly feel this is a great product and will really help to save our lives. Thanks, CJ. Currently, we have 45 letters of intent from firefighters who are eager to get their hands on FireHUD. We are shooting for a price point of around $1,500, which would be only a small incremental cost compared to the around $11,000 firefighters pay for their air gear now. We are also in talks with one of the largest firefighting equipment manufacturers in the US who produce around 90% of all masks in our country. We hope to integrate our product into their line of safety equipment. We've worked really hard on FireHUD and we've taken it to firefighters and they're super excited about it and we hope that you are too. Thank you. Well done. Well done, Team FireHUD. All right, judges. I am uh, 
I'm sure you're burning with questions, yeah. so go first. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you for being our, our heroes and not to discredit that at all. We just want to know more, a little more about the market size. You said there was a million, potentially a million firefighters that could use this. Could this technology be put in other verticals to make y the, your business larger? That's, that's a great question. So actually in military applications, bio waste management, construction, all of these um, area, all these areas use the same exact mask as firefighters do, and it would be applicable to those markets, markets as well. And how, how big are those markets? Well, military is definitely the biggest, and well, that, sure. I mean that's. <laughs> I mean, it's almost unlimited okay. as far yeah, as military, but... Just to add on to that, we have a universal attachment with these Scott masks that the other uh, sectors also use. Okay. Do you have single suppliers for, the for all this equipment, or isn't it a municipal or state by... Do you have to go sort of, you know, uh, city by city and get it accepted? Yeah, so usually the firefighters buy their masks, like the, the departments or the state will buy equipment for all the firefighter departments, mm -hmm. but they usually buy, buy their equipment from distributors, and that's what we're working with right now. We want a license to a distributor that would help us with that process. Aren't there competitors whose business you might be taking who won't be so happy with this? Um, is, are you talking about like just the heads-up display part, like our product? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so there's not really too many things that are tailored towards firefighters. Like, there's things like such as Google Glass, which are heads-up displays, but they're not meant for the heat or for their masks. Um, and there's also sensors that firefighters, uh, they're just coming to the market, but they don't provide the t uh, information in real time. So then it's an additional cost on top of what they're paying now. Yes. Yeah. It's an in incremental cost. Viv, we've that, got less than a minute. That, uh, your $1,500 price point, what does that get to when you scale? That's what we expected around 10,000 units. Mm -hmm. So when we go up, we expect it to go down by around a, a couple hundred dollars. But I mean, for now, that's what we're aiming for with a. And how, how price sensitive is that? How price sensitive? Yeah. Anything to say? Um, yeah, you got it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can you explain a little bit more? Sorry. Yeah. Absolutely. Are, are firefighters or municipalities prepared to pay $1,500? Or are they going to say you bring in something at 1000 you bring something at 500 We need a, we need a yes or no because time's OK. Um, yes, they, they can afford it because they, they spend a lot of money on their gear now. And this is, compared mm -hmm. to that, it's. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Team Firehood. <laughs> You've gotten us off to a great start. Ashley is in the audience with a Firehud fan who can tell us a little bit more about how they got here. Things sure are heating up on stage, Faith. But yes, I have with me Amanda Richardson, the wife of the firefighter you just saw on stage, who actually inspired this invention. Now, Amanda, share with me the spark, if you will, that gave way to Firehud. So Zach and my husband, CJ, were talking at a bonfire, and they were talking about how um, a real fire is, the, um, is a really, very hot, and um, the smoke is very dark and stents you can't see and th that, um, you know, firefighters have a hard time and they can really come into trouble um, with their health as a result of um, the stress that they undergo in a fire. Okay, so talking about fire at a bonfire, that is very meta. So they put on these fire huds, which stands for Heads Up Display, HUD. What's it like inside there? I have to know. So just like on a video game on the, um, on the screen, you can see icons at the bottom. Um, you'll see when you put it on, um, towards the bottom left, you'll see a little square, and it'll kind of give the biometrics from that. And they take that from a little ear in the earpiece, and that's where you can get the, um, the information. Okay, so it's like a digital video game. It's like a Dave and Buster's experience up in there. Okay, I've got to try one of those on later. But if you thought that the presentation was on fire on stage, later when the polls open, you're going to text keyword FIREHUD to 22333. Again, once voting has opened, I'll tell you when. Back to you, Faith. All right, we've got four more teams and only a one-hour show, so let's take a look at our next team from Duke University, Team Biometrics. Hi, we're Biometrics from Duke University. Every year, NCAA athletes will lose about 60 days of gameplay due to injury, missing out on huge opportunities. Luckily, almost 70% of those injuries are preventable. By quantifying how athletic form fails under fatigue, we empower athletes to improve their resilience to injury and stay healthier longer. All right, Team Biometrics, let's race right into your presentation. <laughs> here we go. Hi, my name is Gabby and I'm here with my co-founder, Ivana. We're both varsity athletes from Duke with experience in mechanical engineering and data analytics. 
Now, I was a second team All-American, but I really only spent half of my time training and competing at a high level. The second half, I spent recovering from injury and rehabbing from surgery. But I am not unique. NCAA athletes lose, on average, 30 days to injury each year, with 70% of these injuries, next slide, being completely preventable, largely because they're due mostly to biomechanical issues. We spent the last four years desperately searching for a solution to this issue, and really the best thing that we found is staring into a mirror looking for bad form with our PTs on their iPhones recording. So let's test your eyes. Have you noticed that I tend to asymmetrically load on my left leg or that my hips are actually positioned in a way that I'm more susceptible to another labral tear? Well, Biometrics has. Biometrics provides physical therapists with exactly the biomechanical injury risk factors that they currently look for to make clinical decisions, but now it's faster, it's more objective, and we're able to do it anywhere, even beyond the training room. Biometrics is the only truly high-performance wearable sensor available in the market today. It's custom designed specifically for the needs of elite level athletes and can be worn on any of five different locations on the body directly on the skin. The sensor itself is being used at Duke University and UNC as a strong diagnostic tool right now in the research setting. In the fall, with five universities in the NCAA, we are launching our first real-time feedback application for coaches and athletes. And later next year, we'll be launching our first training and rehabilitation uh, optimization tool, specifically with five, or, excuse me, with 20 universities in the NCAA. We've gained incredible traction over the past year and have even forged a strong partnership with one of the world's leading motion capture firms. These are customers that understand fully our value proposition. So to help you understand, we'd like to use this example with Stanford University. Over the three years, Stanford athletes will incur over 3,000 injuries. With our early projections, Biometrics can save them over $1.4 million in rehabilitation costs alone with our platform. That's two sensors per athlete, plus a subscription to our software. The athletic tech space is booming and on the rise. But if I can stress one thing, it's that this is uniquely different. Unlike any other platform, this is injury prediction. This is injury prevention. Biometrics fuses the ease of use of consumer wearable technology with the deep analytical insight from clinical solutions to provide our users with something that is truly usable and impactful. With the traction and excitement that we've stirred in Division I athletics, we are excited to move into professional NCAA. Okay, we've crossed the finish line. Sorry, i got to cut you off right, here. Thank you Thank so you. much. Judges, who is the first question for biometrics? Um, I'm not an elite athlete, but I used to be, and I run triathlons still, and I'm wondering cool. what exactly you're gonna do for me. You know, when I, when I get a running shoe, they take a picture of me, and, and I run in place, and then they analyze my biomechanics. So a lot of this already exists. So what exactly yeah. new are you bringing to the market, other than that I wear this? Yeah, so it's taking that exact application that you have in a one sort of instance occasion, and now we're taking it and we're applying it throughout your entire training. So if you know that you are a heel striker and so you need a little bit more structure in your shoe, then we're able to provide you that feedback if you're actually performing, if the shoe is giving you the support that you need, but really that your biomechanics are leading you mm -hmm. to that point that you're not gonna be injured like the week before your triathlon. And specifically because the way that you're running on a treadmill in the store or in the clinic is not the same way that you run on a trail, on a track, or any other environment that you might find yourself in. We've been able to see differences in, in running form and biomechanics between people on different surfaces and different terrains, and that's hugely important. Mm -hmm. so, so what's your distribution channel? How are so, you gonna get, get this out there? So right now we're actually working independently with uh, the universities themselves. Okay. We have a strong partnership with Teamworks. It's a company that's currently working with athletic departments, over 60% of the NCAA. Uh, warm introductions lead to contracts. We're also working with uh, Motion Analysis Corporation. They are the, one of the world's largest motion capture firms and they sell our sensors or have the potential to sell our sensors directly to their users. Okay. And how much is each sensor? Right now, we are on a very small scale. Uh, the sensors are fairly expensive, about $250 each. Uh, once we are able to get to at least 5,000 quantity, that price goes down to about $100. Okay. Do you see this as a consumer product and not just selling to universities? Uh, right now, institutional athletics is the best market to utilize our product. Eventually, once we can build up analytics that it's easy enough for a user to understand, we can have a huge impact in the, in the consumer market. Over $6.2 billion in prevention needs just for endurance athletes. 
interesting. What about, um, this may seem a little far afield, but in biometrics, the issue of privacy and surveillance, because this is data, and that data is uploaded mm -hmm. to the cloud, I think, in your example. Mm -hmm. Have you given that any thought in terms of what happens to this data? Mm -hmm. So right now, we're entirely HIPAA certified, and so we're trying to comply with everything. We're mm -hmm. really looking to the guidelines of individual uh, institutions to help us understand what we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, realistically, there's power in having this data. We can aggregate it. We can uh, strip it of its individual uh, user information and really use it to do some real good understanding okay. how biomechanics changes. That's it for time. I'm sorry we've run out Thank of time. So I didn't even have time to ask our triathlete if he shaves his legs. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, let's send things over to Ashley, who is standing by with one of Biometrics' top supporters. Ashley? Thanks, Faith. I'm here with Brandon Sassuni, Program Coordinator at Duke Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And Brandon, I hear the biometric story is a love story. I love. What is that story? Yeah, they met as uh, athletes at Duke, and Gabby was injured, and Ivana basically decided that she wanted to create a solution. So they, they started dating, and they made the biometric solution together to help people like Gabby prevent future injuries. Okay, so motivated out of love. And I hear the lifestyle of an inventor is pretty rough. Tell me about that. Yeah, they're always staying up late, either uh, whiteboarding or playing ping pong. Playing ping pong, yes, that definitely sounds grueling. And now back to people's choice. So for all the sports fans rooting for biometrics, later in the show you're going to want to text, oh, what was that? Biometrics. I said vote biometrics. That's your keyword to 22333, and now I'll send it back to Faith for a little more info on how all of our inventive teams got here tonight. Faith. Thanks, Ashley. The ACC Inventor Prize really is a unique opportunity for college students. This show is being broadcast on eight PBS stations across the ACC, representing 11 of the 15 conference schools and of course we're also being simulcast across the world wide web so as you can imagine our ACC and Venture Prize finalists worked extremely hard to earn a place on tonight's stage how hard you ask let's take a look the road to the first ever ACC and Venture Prize began at home for participants from all 15 ACC schools as each held its own competition to decide who would represent them at tonight's conference wide competition in Atlanta all told, more than 4,000 students competed, with the top teams from each school arriving in Atlanta just yesterday. But students didn't have much time to relax. After checking in, it was straight to the preliminary round. Welcome everybody, thanks for coming. Where a panel of judges representing all 15 ACC schools asked the questions necessary to whittle the field from the 15 participants. What differentiates you as a business model? What's your strategy for beta testing this and where would you do it? How would you manufacture this at any scale? To our five finalists. University of North Carolina, Boston College, Georgia Tech, University of Virginia, Duke University. Literally setting the stage for the competition's final round. The moment we've all been waiting for. But only one team can hold tonight's title. Who will win the first ever ACC Inventor Prize? As you just saw, many of our teams have traveled a long way to be here tonight. So let's get right back to it with the team from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Team Communigift. We're Communigift from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. There are 18 million kids' birthday parties in the U.S. every year, and we're all familiar with the tables of overflowing presents that surround the birthday culture. What if birthdays look different? What if they weren't about the gifts that often go unappreciated? What if we could create impact from these celebrations that generate more than $10 billion in spending annually? We're building community gifts to reinvent birthdays by redefining what it means to feel special. Okay, you guys, tell us your story before I start crying. Hi, I'm Thomas Deutsch, one of the co-founders at Community Gift, and I'm joined on stage by Zach Neubauer and Jack Wolford. So we've all been to the kid's birthday party and have witnessed the table overflowing with presents. The whole model is broken. As a guest, you receive an invitation, and then three weeks later, on the day of the party, you're rushing to the store to buy an item that you know oftentimes will be opened, played with once or twice, and ultimately end up in a closet. As a result of this, we're telling kids at six and seven that feeling special on their special day is about excess of items they don't really need nor desire. This is happening 18 million times a year in the United States. Tony, can we go two slides ahead? But we believe something different. We believe birthdays can be about eight-year-old Lucas deciding that instead of receiving 20 Nerf footballs for four years in a row, that he's gonna help a child less fortunate like Omar have gifts he's never had before. 
We believe birthdays can be an opportunity for kids at the youngest ages to learn how rewarding, convenient, and fun giving back can be. So we built just that. So this is what Lucas's birthday page would look like if you're a guest of his party. You'd come, you'd be able to read about the party details in RSVP, and then you could read about the birthday buddy that Lucas himself selected from one of our nonprofit partners. You'd be able to buy an item that ships directly from our site to the nonprofit that is then gifted to Omar. But more than just a big belief and a cute screenshot, we've launched and it's worked. In the past four months since we launched our pilot in Los Angeles, we've seen over 1,600 guests invited to the platform. About 515, or 70% of those who have RSVP'd, purchased an item for a child in need while RSVPing. And most impressively, we've seen a growth coefficient of three and a half, meaning for every community gift party hosted, three guests have signed up for their own community gift birthday. We've also been fortunate to be featured in TechCrunch and on NPR. We've also created a revenue model that's inherent to our value as a company. Rather than charging the donor or the nonprofit, we receive a percentage of every product purchased from our retail partners. Right now, we're working with exclusively Target, but we hope to expand and go direct from manufacturer. Beyond just our retail partners, our nonprofit partners play a very important role in what we do. They help us find the children in need and handle the distribution of the gifts. We're working with great national partners like Boys and Girls Club and Salvation Army, as well as hyper-local partners within each city. These partners are huge in our ability to scale and also help us build a competitive advantage. On that note, we're really excited about building a company at the intersection of and tech. Time. Oh, the intersection of tech and uh, bouncy castles. And on that note, um, one last thing. Yeah, no, sorry, it's for time for, is it, we gotta be fair. <laughs> it's like clowns without borders, you guys. All right. Um, so listen, I've got three kids, I get this, I understand cool, it. Fantastic. But let, help me understand, you're in market, you've run a pilot, I'm gonna ask you three very simple questions. What did you do? What did you learn? And what are you doing differently as a result of that pilot? Fantastic question. So we launched and we wanted to learn as quickly as we could. And so I think our two biggest lessons were one, how important this internal growth drivers were gonna be, right? So we didn't need to go spend a ton on acquisition if, if guests were turning into hosts. So in providing an incredible experience for guests where they understood what was going on and felt the impact was really important to grow our user base. Two, we realized how important our nonprofits were gonna be in our ability to scale. So we realized that we could go and we could seed markets by forming one nonprofit partnership within each city and watching growth before we started to spend within each city. Um, I have a problem with your core concept. My name is Little Johnny and I want my birthday present. Why yeah. are you taking it away? <laughs> Absolutely fantastic question. And so we, we thought that going in as well. And then there was something when we put the platform in front of the kids and we said, enter your birthday and find another child and read about them. And it just clicks. They, they say and they read and they put in their birthday and they say, so you're telling me Omar is not going to have any of this if I don't help. And the answer is yes, and they connect. And so it seems counterintuitive. It seems like it doesn't work, but all the data shows that giving truly is better than receiving. And so we're trying to build a platform that really fosters that notion mm -hmm. and brings us back to this society where giving back feels good and you're proud of it. Tammy? Interesting. Um, so Facebook has a million, no, I'm sorry, a billion users, and um, they've had gift platforms in the past Absolutely. and they have not worked out. So what's going to be your you know, differentiator yeah, to kind of absolutely. get that distribution that they Yeah, have. and that's a fantastic question too, because there's been a ton of gifting yeah. startups that have ultimately end up dying away. So what I think is, I think our aspect of coming at it from a social and a charitable aspect is something that hasn't been seen before. So there are a lot of gifting platforms that was like, recommend a good gift for a friend, mm -hmm. buy that gift, things like that. And we're saying, let's like break this concept that it's about receiving on a celebration. And let's bring you back to giving. And so we think that like that notion is gonna lead to, to incredible engagement and incredible experience. And thus we're gonna be able to find great growth. So our kind of our big hypothesis Hypothesis is relying on that notion that giving feels really, really good. What do your two co-founders do? Yeah, so yeah. Jack, Jack handles. <laughs> Hi, over there. They don't, <laughs> they, speak, they right? don't speak. They don't speak. They don't speak. So Jack handles all of our development work, and Zach actually handles all of our partnership stuff with our nonprofits. Okay. Great. Zach, you made a move to say something. I'm going to let you. Go for it. I was going to say I feel like the luckiest of the three. Our, our, our partners are amazing. We have incredible relationships with them. Um, they're in both in LA and in North Carolina now as we look. Ten to seconds. Anybody got a final? We negotiated the deal with Target. So we worked with a third-party universal shopping cart company called Cosmic Cart that fostered that relationship. Okay. okay. That's it. There's your answer. Thank you, judges. Thank Insightful you. questions as always. Thank you. Now let's send it back to Ashley, who I believe is standing by with a member of the Communigift community. 
That's right, Faith. I'm here with Brent Macon, the co-founder of Primer Sports and a mentor to this team. So, Brent, they just asked the question. I'm thinking of those seven-year-olds, even those 30-year-olds who might not handle this concept maturely. Do those self-serving habits die hard? Well, it's a magic moment when you take a kid, show them another kid that looks a lot like them, and tell them that they can have the chance to give them their first ever birthday present. Um, it just feels better to give. Does it? Okay, I'm going to give you this microphone. Take it. Bye-bye. Bye. I guess I'll host then. Oh, no, no. I think I'd rather. No, I don't want to give it. I felt good about it for just a second. I know it's been a tough week for UNC basketball, but what would it mean to take home the first e oh, whoa, whoa. The first ever W for the ACC Adventure Prize? so a little bit too soon for that question. Uh, Oops. But it would just show UNC's got a great commitment to entrepreneurship as well as athletics. So uh, didn't get the W on Monday, but hopefully Community Gift gets the W tonight. But you could tonight in the spirit of innovation. So that key word for later is Community Gift, and you're going to text that number to 22333 if they've stolen your heart later in the show. And now back to you, Faith, to introduce us to our next finalist. Our next team is ready to take the stage. Show from the University of Virginia, Let's Meet Team Contraline. Hi, I'm from Team Contraline from the University of Virginia, and we're solving the problem of a lack of appealing male contraceptives. Of the 1.5 billion sexually active men worldwide, 73% rely on their female partners to use contraception. Contraline is developing a revolutionary, non-surgical approach to a problem faced by millions of people every day, and we're happy to provide them with an appealing solution. Okay, Team Contraline, it's on the line, go. Hi, my name is Kevin Eisenfratz and I'm the co-founder of Contraline. We're a biotechnology company from the University of Virginia and we're creating a new male contraceptive. Since the birth control pill came out 60 years ago, there have been many other contraceptives to hit the market, but they all have one thing in common. They put the responsibility on women. Out of the 1.5 billion sexually active men worldwide, 73% rely on women for contraception. And why is that? It's because men only have two options, condoms or vasectomy. Condoms are single use, they have a failure rate of 18% and a dissatisfaction rating of 57%. And vasectomy, while it's effective, it requires surgery and it's too permanent. So we went out and asked men, women, and physicians, what would you like in a new male contraceptive? So what we are designing is the first long-lasting, non-hormonal, and reversible male birth control for men. So how does it work? It comes in the form of a polymer solution that is injected into the vas deferens, the tubes that transport sperm. The solution forms a gel that blocks sperm from going through, but it could be reversed at any point with another solution that depolymerizes and flushes the gel out. We have the first gel that is echogenic or visible under ultrasound that allows the urologist to confirm the procedure was successful and check on the gel years later to see it's still there and working properly. But then we want to take this another step forward. What if this whole procedure can be done as simple and quick as a flu shot? So we invented a new medical procedure that is non-surgical called vas intimi that uses an ultrasound to do the injection through the skin. It's quick, it's painless, and because it's less invasive, there are fewer complications from it. With our invention and our new medical procedure, we are tackling the global contraceptive industry, which is valued at $18 billion and is growing at a rate of 6% every year. Our comparable product is the IUD for women, which brought in $1.1 billion in 2014, is growing at 10%. Our target market for vasectomy are the 12.2 million men in the U.S. that are considering vasectomy or whose female partners are discontent with their steroidal contraceptive options. Altogether, this is a $2.7 billion opportunity. We have an incredible team of undergraduate biomedical engineers from UVA who are spearheading the product development. We have won multiple university and national awards for our invention, which we have used to collect proof of concept data. And on top of that, we have an incredible interdisciplinary team of advisors, including biotech entrepreneurs, including biomedical engineering professors, urologists, and pharmaceutical executives. Together, we have one mission, to create the first safe, effective and appealing contraception for men. That is why we believe at Contraline, we're creating the future of male contraception. All right, now, uh, you know, when some inventors discover something, they say, Eureka! Did you say, Urethra? <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. Okay, you guys probably have better questions. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna follow that one. So oh. help me understand, is this a device or a drug? This is definitely a device. It's a device, okay. And talk me through your plans for FDA approval. So it's gonna take about five years. Um, we have three stages. The first stage is rat trials, which we're actually starting in the next uh, month or two. Yep. 
that's going to take about six to eight months. Then we plan on doing canine trials. That's going to take about a year. And then we do human clinical trials, pivotal studies. Because it's a device, we only need about 100 patients to do those trials. So this is a, it's a much shorter time period and less money um, to get the FDA approval than the drug. You said this was the first, but I mean, there were several, including I think one called the IVD that did have FDA approval and that did target the same part of the anatomy. So can you explain why that one didn't work and what you're doing that's different? Sure. So what didn't work about the IVD was the fact that this was not a porous material. What they did was they had to actually exteriorize the tube, put a device in. This was literally a hard silicon, silicone device. And then after that, um, they would require to suture the device in place and there could be complications because of that, infections. Our device is porous, so fluid could travel through, but, um, so fluid could travel through, but sperm cannot. Right, and it's yet got, they did have FDA approval, so, which you're five years away from, right, by your own, so there's a, a lot of still hurdles to go. Sure, the, you know, the silicone device, the IVD you're talking about, that was done in China. I don't have too much information about their approval process. I could talk more about Vasal Gel, which is a competitor that's being made in the US, for instance. What's the price point for this procedure? Sure. So because we're so early, we can't talk definitively. Sure. Um, our, first of all, our primary goal is to get insurance companies to reimburse this 100% mm -hmm. as they currently uh, do with vasectomy. A vasectomy on average costs about $1,000. We believe that our procedure will cost about $900, which will include the injection, the checkup with the ultrasound a few months later, and the reversal. So, but then you also have to consider, just because it's a little cheaper than a vasectomy, it's only lasting five years, and it's a recurrent revenue model for the urologist. Every five years, the patient's coming back. What are the side effects? So we don't know yet because we haven't started the human clinical trials. I can tell you that all of the materials we're using are biocompatible and they're FDA approved for other devices. So this is, you're going to require very heavily here on getting social acceptance because you're reframing the way people think. Five seconds, got a quick one? So to answer that question, absolutely. 55% of men in a 9,000 person study said that they would use a new contraceptive. 90% of men time, believe- Time, 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 gotta cut you off, I'm sorry. You, this product may not win people's choice, but it'll win ladies' choice, I think. Um, <laughs> all right, let's, let's see, Ashley, what questions do you have for Team ContraLines fan section? Thanks, Faith. I'm here with Alex Zaretta, the Works in Progress Program Coordinator at the University of Virginia. Now, Alex, I have to ask, how was this invention, shall we say, conceived? So. So Kevin's a dog guy, and this originally was um, thought of for animals, but upon doing more market research, he realized that there was a huge need for adult men. Okay, so from animals to men, not such a huge leap, am I right, ladies? And how does this appeal to a male audience in particular? Well, women have you know the IUD and a lot of other choices. The IUD you don't have to think about, and it's easily reversible. For men, vasectomy is just too much commitment. Famous last words, too much commitment. Okay, when we get to that point, oh baby, you can choose ContraLine, texting keyword ContraLine to 22333 for the People's Choice Award. And again, that's 22333, but not yet. Back to you, Faith. Our next presenters are also our last of the evening, which means they have been waiting long enough. From Boston College, meet Team Motion. Hi, we're from Team Motion from Boston College. The overabundance of music services on the market today has created a lack of social interactivity between listeners and monetary support for music artists. Music is an emotional experience that's meant to be shared in the present moment. Motion addresses this problem with a real-time technological solution that will change the way millions of people share, discover, and listen to music. Welcome to the future of radio. Okay, that is a cliffhanger. Go. So. Music is a universal language. It moves us, it transforms us, and we are drawn to sharing it. There's a problem though. This device is flawed. It was designed for an isolated music experience that traps us in our own music bubbles. Say I want to run with Dirks. When we put our headphones in, he's trapped in his bubble and I'm trapped in mine. Motion addresses this problem. Whether we're skiing with our buddies or stunning with our friends, the Motion platform leverages patent pending technology that enables anybody to play the same song at the same exact time. Durs can stream a song from any music streaming service. Right now he's playing one of his favorite songs on SoundCloud and broadcasting it to his followers on the Motion platform. Out of the millions of streamers in the world, any of them can choose to tap into my broadcast. Now, I'm not that popular, but your favorite athlete, artist, or celebrity is. From a local artist to someone like Taylor Swift, 
Anyone can create a broadcast and their fans can listen in live. Imagine, a whole city could listen in live to Steph Curry while he's in the locker room before the NBA Finals. Motion is a real-time music platform that is fundamentally changing the way that we experience music. On our platform, you're going to be able to do things like create a live broadcast in which you can talk over like a live radio host or create a collaborative playlist with friends. We're currently addressing a market of 180 million SoundCloud users and 30 million Spotify premium users. That number continues to grow as we build out Motion for other streaming services. We can currently generate revenue in four different ways. We can run an ad before a broadcast begins. We can license out our technology. We're currently building out a modern day jukebox feature in which users can bid on the next song in a public venue. And we have sponsored stations. A sponsored station means a company brand or music label pays us to be featured on our homepage. That means that when a motion user gets on our application, they see that company brand or music labels broadcast and can choose to tap right in. So the highest cost in developing an application like this is hiring the team with the necessary skills to create it. Luckily for us, we're a team of developers that can bring Motion to market. We live in Boston with 100, over 100,000 students. It is the perfect location for us to be located. We surveyed 500 students and found that 75% of them are willing to pay for what Motion does. We have about 1,000 signups and are excited to release our second beta within the next few weeks. And now we're gonna show you a live demo with the rest of the Motion team coming out. They're playing out of the different branded Bluetooth speakers. So essentially what we have is a more mobile and social version of Sonos. Thank you. All right, judges, let's hear your questions for Team Motion. <laughs> we can keep it. <laughs> uh, so you reference Spotify. They're up to about 75 million, let's say, users, of which 30 million are paying. So it's a freemium model. And they're still not making money. They're, they're a lot of revenue, but they're not profitable. So mm -hmm. how are you going to actually show a profit? Yeah, so we're just teaming up with these streaming services. Um, Essentially, our users are their users, so it's important to note that our technology not only scales to Spotify, it scales to SoundCloud, Apple Music, and the rest on the market. Our revenue model isn't contingent upon the business model that streaming services had. Um, we have a sponsored station which is contingent upon scalability and advertisements. As Durs mentioned, these sponsored stations are where ad companies are gonna come in and say we have LeBron James uh, streaming on his services, we can have the ad company pay us $20 per 1,000 views, which is a business model that is similar to Snapchat, um, Hulu, and YouTube. But before we even get there, we have this modern day jukebox feature, which allows a bar or um, anybody that's um, at a fundraising activity to enable their users or community bid on the next upcoming song to, um, to control the ambiance in the room. So it's a fun interactive way for us to make money and for you to make money as well. I'm struggling with really understanding the problem that you're trying to solve for. So like, what, who's the customer and what's the problem? Yeah, so our target demographic user is the normal everyday college student and high school student. Mm -hmm. um, a joke is that millennials like never really talk to one another. We use all these social applications. So we're building in a, a social application that revolves around music. And music is one of the uh, most powerful forms of communication because mm -hmm. we're tapping into another person's emotion in the present moment. Have you reinvented the concert, the live concert? Because there, you, people do come together and listen to music yeah, exactly. at one time. Yeah. yeah, silent discos, things of that nature. Yeah. You can get. You can go crazy with this. Yeah. What's the difference? How, how is this different from like uh, Periscope or Meerkat? So we're very similar to Periscope, except we're just doing it real time audio and we're creating an entire experience around music. Okay. Our latencies are a lot lower than Periscope too because the latency necessary yeah, that's... for a perfect synchronization of audio is less than 10 milliseconds. Okay. Great. So I can take... Okay, thank you. Okay. Team Motion, thank you very much. And thank you judges. Our judges have asked a lot of thought-provoking questions and all of our teams were up to the challenge, so deciding tonight's wi winner is not going to be an easy task. And with that said, I will send you off to deliberate or arm wrestle or whatever you people do. 
Uh, that also means it's almost time to, ca to open up the voting for tonight's People's Choice Award. So everyone should stand by for that. But before we open up the voting, I'm going to send things back to Ashley, who's now joined by someone with a little more insight regarding Team Motion's path to our stage. Ashley? Thanks, Faith. I'm here with Kelsey Kenton, Assistant Director for the Shea Center for Entrepreneurship at Boston College. Now, Kelsey, how did Motion get its name? Motion is a musical ocean. Okay, so it's a word mashup like Brangelina. Exactly. Okay, now I understand. Now tell me, one thing that's always bothered me about some of the other music platforms out there is there's not a lot of autonomy. You can't select a song, choose to repeat a song. If I want to play the song I really love, Let It Go, on repeat, it won't let me. Can you do that with Motion? Let It Go. Are you referring to the song from Frozen, the children's movie? Don't worry about it, Kelsey. Just answer the question, please. Uh, motion is completely controlled by the user. So the user has the opportunity to search songs, create playlists, and repeat whatever song you're so inclined to listen to. Perfect. I'm feeling emotional just talking about this right now. Thank you so much. If Kelsey here or you think that you emotional should be winning tonight's People's Choice Award, well, you know what to do. The keyword is motion, M-O-C-E-A-N. You're going to text that to 22333. And when do you say... Now is the answer, because now that our final team has presented, it is time to open up the voting for our People's Choice Award. So to vote, you can text your favorite team's keyword to 22333, or you can vote online at pollev.com slash InventurePrize. Remember, the winner of our People's Choice Award tonight will receive a welcome $5,000 to help them bring their invention to market. Now, here are those keywords one more time. To vote for Team Firehud to win the People's Choice Award, text FIREHUD to 22333. To vote for biometrics, the keyword is biometrics. If you want to see Team Communigift display this year's trophy at a kid's birthday party, the key is Communigift. If you want to vote for the latest in male contraception, that's Contraline to 22333. And finally, if you're like me, feeling emotional, you can text MOTION, M-O-C-E-A-N, for the People's Choice Award at 22333. So remember to keep an eye out for that pesky autocorrect when you're texting those keywords because the names must be spelled exactly as they appear on screen or or your vote will not register. And remember, you can only vote one time per device. Voting is now open, but it won't stay open for long, so get those happy thumbs and moving, people, and we'll have the results for you shortly. In the meantime, how is the judges' deliberation coming, Faith? Thank you, Ashley. Our judges are safely tucked away in a bunker approximately 10 stories below the stage, deciding who will take home tonight's first and second place prizes. And while they do that, I am joined by one of the visionaries for the first ever ACC Inventure Prize, the Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs at the Georgia Institute of Technology, Dr. Rafael L. Braz. Hello. Hello. Thank Thanks. you How for are you? Us. Nice. Nice for having me here. Thank you. Dr. Braz, we hear a lot more about college athletics than academics these days. What was your inspiration for the ACC Inventure Prize? Well, we know that the ACC is a tremendous sports conference, but what not many people realize that it's really an extraordinary academic conference uh, with top schools, wonderful students. The provost of the ACC started meeting about two years ago and thinking, uh, what can we do to effectively evolve and show that strength. Uh, we thought a lot of things in common and what we all had in common was the interest of creating, developing the creativity, the innovation, the leadership skills of our students. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that at the end, uh, everybody agreed that the Inventure Prize really fit that mode to, uh, as a way of bringing together the conference and enjoying a good time. Why do you think there is such a movement towards innovation and entrepreneurship on college campuses? Well, uh, creativity is, is the expression of knowledge. It's, it's, it's uh, expressing knowledge of people, of uh, things, of engineering, of science. And it shows itself in many, many, many ways. Uh, and the interest is because we all want, all of you, all the wonderful students we have, to start thinking a little bit like when you were kids, with, with that playful sense of innovation and creativity, taking risks. And, that's why we're here. That's what the Inventure Prize is all about. It's the opportunity for all of us to have a good time, good time learning, good time creating, thank and you. good time innovating. Thank, thank you very you, much. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Bratz, and thank much, you to everyone you who's done so much to bring this competition thank together. You.
And speaking of those other schools he just mentioned, Ashley has teleported herself backstage. And hey, can someone invent that, by the way, next year? Um, in any case, she is standing by with the 10 semifinalist teams who participated in last night's preliminary round. Ashley? Voila, Faith, I've arrived. I'm here with some champions in their own right, the semifinalists of this competition. We have some time for a brief elevator pitch from each of them, maybe like one floor in length. So I'm going to come around if you guys will tell me what school you're with and what you invented, starting with you. Uh, I'm Colin Schlageter from Clemson University, and I've invented a cost-efficient replacement for styrofoam coolers and a new form of insulation for tents and ski jackets. Wow, sounds warm. University of Pittsburgh, and we've created a portable oxygen device that stores one hour of oxygen in a soda can. We have the University of Louisville and we developed rentable electronically assisted devices with solar charging stations. All right, moving down here. Is this Banco de Alimentos Panama? Volé, okay. We're the Marcus siblings with Banco Alimentos Panama, an organization that distributes food to those in need. We're from Florida State University and we leverage crowdfunding to help house homeless individuals with stable income. Very awesome. Back here. We're Easy Cork from Wake Forest University, and we created an innovative way to open a bottle of wine without the need of a corkscrew. Embarrassed to say how much I'd use that? Okay, right here. We're from Virginia Tech, and we give distribution centers a map of their trail yard. You guys. We're Syracuse University, and we created an influencer marketplace for Twitch, which connects Twitch streamers, esports organizations, and sponsors under one platform. Power Spike. Hey, we're NC State, and we uh, invented the quickest way to dimension shipments. Okay, and last, but certainly not least, we're from the University of Miami, and our free app, Royal, takes your existing debit and credit cards and turn them into a universal loyalty card where you don't have to change the way you shop to be rewarded. You guys must do a lot of shopping. That sounds great. And now back to Faith on stage, who should be joined by our judges now. Faith, are they there? Yes, that's right, Ashley. Our judges have finally emerged from their hemi-anechoic chamber or some room backstage, um, which means we're just about ready to crown tonight's winners. But first, I really want to hear from each of you, what was the toughest part of tonight's decision, Tammy? Oh, there was a lot of talented uh, students. Yeah, I was, I was surprised at the quality of the yeah. responses as well. I mean, it's okay to do your presentation, but you know, we were pushing them really hard and they, they knew their stuff. Yeah. We want everyone to keep dreaming, so we hate to dash anyone's dreams, but we yeah. have to pick two. So. Was it pretty unanimous? We want the rest of you to keep dreaming. Yes. Yeah. It was, really. 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we were like-minded. Yep. Yes. I mean, it took That's a couple true. of bottles of wine, but it was unanimous. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I hope you used the, the, the team that invented the, uh, the way to open the bottle without the corkscrew. Yeah. That. Yeah. Oh, where um, are they? Well, that one. <laughs> um, well, thank you, judges, for, for your hard work. And, you know, let's not keep our teams waiting any longer. Finalists, would you please join us back on stage? And, and judges, would you like to join me up front? People's Choice Envelope, please. Thank you. Ah, oh, the sound of Velcro. All right, the People's Choice Award and a check for $5,000 is Firehud from Georgia Tech. Congratulations, guys. Uh, and now it is time to announce our second place winner. The team will be receiving a check for $10,000 to help take their idea to the next level. Viv, may I have the envelope, please? Okay. I know, right? Okay. So yours. And, all right. Uh, the runner up for the 2016 ACC Inventure Prize is Team Contraline from University of Virginia. <laughs> You. Who was the biggest naysayer along the way? What was your biggest obstacle? Biggest obstacle were the veterinarians that told us our idea <laughs> wasn't uh, good, which led us to actually go to contraception for men. So this is for all, this is for all you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thanks to the vets. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. Doran, may I have the envelope, please? All right, and the winner of the first ever ACC Inventure Prize is Team Biometrics from Duke. Congratulations, ladies. Thank you so much. All right, so please tell us, whom would you like to thank? 
We would like to thank all of the wonderful people uh, at Duke Innovation Entrepreneurship, uh, and specifically Melissa and Doug Bernstein for all the help that they offered. And uh, Yeah, as well as our great advisors. I mean, Zach Marides and Sue Harnett have been a huge support in getting us to here today and into the future. Thank you. Thank you all. And, and, and I think a lot of athletes and colleges will be thanking you. <laughs> so, so what was the most challenging for you guys? We, well, we, we started out with an idea. We had to learn all of the hardware, software, everything from scratch. And it was a fun experience, but, and we've learned quite a bit, but it was quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, starting from square zero, basically. We, we had a vision, and we had to get there somehow. So what's the, what's the one piece of advice you would give some, a college student out there who thinks he or she has a good idea, but, oh, it's going to be so hard to execute it? Don't worry about the idea. Worry about the problem you're about to solve. Mm -hmm. And people are going to say no, so just go for it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Everybody said yes tonight. Congratulations. And that wraps it up for our inaugural ACC Inventure Prize. Congratulations to Team Biometrics, Team Contraline, our People's Choice winner, Team Firehood, as well as all the teams who participated in the finals, the preliminary round, and the thousands of students from the early competitions across all of the ACC schools. Thank you to Ashley, our judges. Thanks to everyone who watched at home, of course, and all of you who voted. I am Faith Saley, and that's it for the first ever ACC Adventure Prize, but we will be back here roughly one year from tonight for the second one, and we hope to see you then. Until then, good Good night, and remember there may be there may not be an I in team, but every accomplishment has an ACC. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>